Hi pals, this is the first episode of our Summer Rerun series. Season 4 has been an amazing journey that started with some of the funniest episodes of Ice and ended with the evilest villain. Over the next three weeks, we've selected a few of our favorite episodes of this podcast for your enjoyment. We are feverishly getting ready for Season 5 and hope that you enjoy the Summer Rerun series. Our first pick and one of our favorite episodes is Honor Among Thieves, a gritty episode of Vice that is one of the darkest storylines while also including a man who prefers the company of dolls. One thing we learned, these dolls sure know how to keep a secret. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, even though we took a week off, we're refreshed. We're ready to go. We have a great episode of Miami Vice. It's season four, episode 16, titled Honor Among Thieves? Question mark. Hmm. <laughs> I, I don't know why there's a question mark in this. I don't know. The name is, doesn't make any sense. Why is it Thieves? No one's stealing anything. That's what I was going <laughs> to say. The the name doesn't seem to fit the episode. I, I see what they're going for, that it's honor among criminals because they're going to try this person yeah, but, who's a but make scumbag. It but. Criminals then. Like, why make it Thieves? No one steals anything. The the huh? Legion of Dumb would have been much better. <laughs> <laughs> this episode premiered on March 4th, 1988. It is written by Jack Richardson. This is his first episode. He's got two more coming. More importantly, based on what we've seen before, is the director is Jim Johnston, who also directed Nobody Lives Forever. But in a similar storyline, he also directed Out Where the Buses Don't Run. You know what's funny? This episode, the writer might not be the most accomplished writer in the episode or uh, involved in the episode. Actually, the guy that plays Paul Delgado, John Bowman, he was a writer for SNL from 84 to 94. He wrote for the sitcom Martin, 92 to 97. He also wrote for Cedric the Entertainer Presents, 2000 to 2003. He was also a writer in Living Color from 90 to 93. So Damn. he was also a producer. Produced the Hughley's he- Murphy Brown Frank TV, where he also wrote some episodes. Damn, so pretty much somewhere between like the early 80s and the mid 90s, you probably heard a lot of his comedy. The creepy guy in this episode? So, yeah, he wrote everything you thought was funny <laughs> in the 90s. Before we get started, the chickens, who's going into each other's lives, guys? Don Johnson is making waves in the news. We mentioned last time we did the show that he was in a new movie where he's one of the hunks for the women oh, in he's the a hunk. In book club. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, an, a, an elderly gentleman hunk. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> So while he was out on that tour, he said some interesting things. He said, one, he'd be open to a Miami Vice reboot, maybe make an appearance. I don't know if that means like appear in the pilot, but not appear on the rest of the show. But he said he was also more interested in a reboot of Nash Bridges. I'm okay with all of those things. <laughs> I could definitely go with some more Nash Bridges. Uh, and I'm pretty sure Cheech Marin's not doing anything. <laughs> Also, sneaking in under the radar, maybe you didn't notice, but HBO has decided to have a pilot made for Watchmen. John's going to give us a little bit more information (laughs) on that for the comic book nerds out there, (laughs) or for the non-comic book nerds. But sneaking in in this cast for the pilot is Regina King, Tim Blake, Lou Gossett Jr., and Don Johnson. The Watchmen, fantastic movie, and in the movie... They pretty much inject the the idea that superheroes have been around since World War One, And so you get a mix in the comics of the Watchmen comics, superheroes in, in the present, and the older superheroes who are like retired superheroes who are still around. And so that's why the older cast kind of makes sense, because Don Johnson could be playing a... Uh, Superhero in his golden years. Mm, interesting. So yeah, that, I, I am very on that. yeah. I'm very excited. Uh, I think the movie was great, but the biggest problem was that it was just really long, and so a lot of people f- thought it was boring. Except for you know geeks like me. Yeah, that and the oh, uh, oh yeah, the blue penis hanging around for the whole movie too. Yeah, that that was a thing. Yeah, the giant blue <laughs> dong. Yeah. <laughs> That was a little distracting. So, but uh, I, I'm really looking forward. 
to the to what HBO can do for it because I think that it can be as good as if not better than the Marvel Netflix shows. Well, John, so, I have uh, another little wrinkle here for you on this show because it's being written and produced by Damon Linden Lindelof. Sorry, David Lindelof. You will recognize him immediately, John, because you're the sci-fi guy. He's co-wrote Tomorrowland, Star Trek in the Darkness, Prometheus, Cowboys and Aliens. I know there's a lot of winners there, <laughs> um, but this is where it's going to get really interesting for John. <laughs> He's also a writer for Nash Bridges. Oh, and a writer oh. and producer for the show Crossing Jordan. Oh, there we go. You hit John right in the sweet spot. <laughs> oh, the Crossing Jordan. Yep, exactly. So this guy's TV royalty. <laughs> to John, yes. <laughs> He's got recent work with The Leftovers with HBO, so that would make sense why they asked him to make the pilot too. Yeah, I'm really excited about this, and there have actually been rumblings about this for a long time. So actually, to find out a little bit about the cast and to find out that DJ's involved, I am super pumped. I don't know how to feel because I don't know that much about the Watchmen, but looking at the cast and who's in it, like, I'm excited. Like, hell yeah, I'd watch it, and I'd watch it, you know, for being an anthology, too. That seems to be the best thing for comic book stuff, in my opinion. Well, we have, speaking of classic stories, this episode of Miami Vice is a classic cop story. This has been in, essentially... Every police drama that's been on TV since like the 60s <laughs> in this story where you have uh, someone who's a crazy serial killer who dresses someone up or talks to dolls. Dolls are somehow involved. And this is a classic story that we have seen a hundred times, especially if you watch modern comp dramas. They make sure this style story is in every single season. So we're looking at you, criminal mind. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> but this one's got a vice twist to make sure that they're in. Actually, in my opinion, it makes it a little bit better because of the drugs to be involved and not just. Being oh, yeah. A, not a, just like a just a regular serial killer, yep, like rapist. Yep. Let's see if they can stick the landing, because right now mm -hmm. we're 0 for 9 in this. Well, <laughs> <season>. <laughs> I guess you, I, we might have varying opinions on, on if they stuck the landing or not. Yeah. Some of us have different opinions i'm sure true true let's get there when <laughs> let's break down this episode first so then we can get there and all agree <laughs> <laughs> all right so when we open up it's the shortest opening in the history of miami vice and the creepiest it's a man yes and they pan around the room and it's full of porcelain dolls and we can we can at least agree right at the very beginning right porcelain dolls are the creepiest dolls that ever existed right they are they give me nightmares the, Especially the, clown ones. Most definitely. <laughs> yes. And what makes it even creepier is we have this Pee Wee Herman looking dude playing doctor. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. <laughs> He's talking as one of the dolls to say, don't cry. He's talking to the person who's tied up to a chair. He then injects the person. So while in the doll's voice, he switches over to himself briefly and then responds in the doll voice, leans in for what looks like it's going to be a kiss. And then we go to the opening credits. It's only about 45 seconds long. Wait a minute. You mean that By wasn't the, way, the doll talking? <laughs> All along. The dorky looking white dude talking to dolls. That's the guy that wrote for Martin. <laughs> Let that sink in. <laughs> it's really short. Really creepy, sets the tone for the entire episode, and the twist that comes at the end, I was surprised about. Now is a good time to talk about the rest of our guest stars, and I will admit, when I first looked at them, I was like, oh, this is a bunch of garbage. But, <laughs> like, like John Bowman, who actually turned out to have some pretty legit credits, to talk about Brian Tarantine, who plays Rickman, he is basically your criminal. He was in Carlito's Way, Donnie Brasco, episodes of Oz and The Sopranos. And aside from playing a, a criminal and or thug, he was also in the soap opera One Life to Live Damn. from 90 to 92. And then from 2004 to, uh, I, I guess now, if it's still on. <laughs> we also have Dylan Baker, who plays L Lieutenant Edward Jarrell. He's the guy we were talking about pre-show. You guys were saying you remembered him from the movie Happiness, where he played such a happy character. What was that <laughs> character doing in that movie again? Uh, it's something I will never, ever forget that this actor played that role. No matter what other movies he's in, he will always be the pedophile that was in the movie Happiness. 
And I'll never let my kids eat a tuna sandwich at anyone else's house either. No. <laughs> After that <laughs> or movie. Be, or be near this actor, even though he has nothing to do with it personally. <laughs> yeah, He's exactly. just playing a role. <laughs> he actually has a mask. In fine arts from Yale School of Drama, which I would imagine would have to be the ritziest uh, drama school out there. When you said that he has a degree, a master's degree in fine arts, I was like, oh, wait, maybe we can see him on Antiques Roadshow. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, like, you know, Harvard's got a law school, Yale's got a drama school. Yeah. Not the same. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan Baker actually started on Broadway, his debut role in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. I want my fucking car right <laughs> now. Fucking yeah. now. Yeah. His first reoccurring TV role was actually a, the highly acclaimed Murder One, which I say highly acclaimed, but I've also never heard of the TV show <laughs> Murder One. So um, I remember him as Dr. Kurt Connors from Spider-Man 2 and 3. But it was also in movies 13 Days, Road to Perdition, Delirious, The Cell. He's actually been in a ton of movies. Oh, yeah. He's instantly recognizable. Yes. And on top of all of that, he is also a narrator of audio books, including books like The Grapes of Wrath and Argo and stuff like that. Doing voice work, an audio book for The Grapes of Wrath. I'm surprised he could talk after reading that book out loud. It is like a thousand huh? pages. Our last guest star is Gary Basarava, who plays Cyrus. And he is basically, the beginning of his Wikipedia basically says he is best known for playing American police officers. <laughs> so, to give you an idea, he appeared in three episodes for the Law & Order franchise. He also appeared in an episode of Blue Bloods, which is about cops. He was also in the TV show Brooklyn South, which was about cops. And he was also in the short-lived... TV show Boomtown, I believe playing a cop. So, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think he plays a cop. I think that's about right. When we come back from the opening credits, we're at a house. It's actually Palmo's house, who's our main uh, drug kingpin, who's going to be in this episode. What keeps us with our vice tie-in? Duo show up to there to meet with Palmo. They pull up in a limo, go inside the house. They're undercover as Burnett and Cooper, and Burnett. I'm sure I'm going to keep a straight face here. Burnett is supposed to be someone with a law degree and who can move money all over the world and is known for being a good lawyer. That was my favorite part of watching this episode is when we're watching Dominic turn to me and he goes, is that supposed to be his, his cover all the time? I was like, no, it's just for this episode. He's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I'm just thinking back, like, if he's supposed to be a lawyer, I'm thinking back to the time where he was doing his fancy boat driving in the, do <laughs> in the docks to try and get someone's attention. Yeah, exactly. What kind of lawyer does that? <laughs> Palmo says that he wants to do business with Burnett and Cooper. That Co And Cooper, I'm sorry. Cooper is Burnett's muscle. He says, quote, unquote, collections. Yes. Palmo mm -hmm. says that he wants to do business with Burnett, but likes it in personal relationships. So he's asking them very nicely at gunpoint, basically, essentially. Yeah. You need to live with me for the next week or so. Yeah, stay with me <laughs> for several days. And they're like, well, we don't have our tuxedos or toothbrushes. Like, well, I got all oh, that Oh, and for he you. starts... He starts with the mind games immediately. He gives them both pink toothbrushes. And he makes them wear those terrible clothes. <laughs> yeah, or not what they would wear. Those tuxedos were terrible. <laughs> Just screwing with their heads. But they have ladies there, so don't worry. Sunny's marriage to Caitlin <laughs> is strong right now, right? You know, hanging on by on a road. thread. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Caitlin, who? Who? Wait. I what? thought that was great. They're uh, up in the room, and they answer the door, and there's a um, clearly a hooker there to take them down to dinner. <laughs> Come on, her name's Arlene. She's not Although a Arlene is a terrible hooker name. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> We have a really fast scene where in the alley you see a man leaving a dead woman who's been dressed up like a doll. And then there's the doll that's like matching how she's dressed. And he just leaves her in the alley. Back at Palmos, we meet Arlene. And also we find out that they're waiting for a contact to meet them at Palmos and give them a code word of when it's time to go. So they're going to move on Palmo when that person comes and gives them the code word. Yeah, someone who works on the inside, who's an informant, basically. At Miami-Dade Homicide, reporters are hounding Lieutenant Gerald, our homicide detective that's going to be in this episode pretty much throughout the rest of the, throughout the, rest of the episode. They're asking about the murders. I, I, strong feeling from this guy that he does not want to actually have to do any work on this case. <laughs> 
I feel like he thinks he's tried enough, and he's like, well, I mean, there's been two. What can I do? <laughs> well, I tried to get after the, he calls, the one. <laughs> after he calls the media whores, they go into that <laughs> private meeting, and he basically says, hey, we found coke on the bodies, so uh, you guys can take over for us. He tells Castillo because of the coke, I think they should take over. And he even went to the mayor, and the mayor said, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Castillo says, hey, my yeah, best ma- people. Mayor Cheese agrees. <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says, hey, my best people are undercover. It is, uh, it, it is his best people. I mean, come on, who's his best? Switek? <laughs> um, oh, yeah. The duo, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure the ladies are the best. <laughs> there's also uh, Trudy and Gina. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, they're, but, they're, but they, they they're also detectives as well. <laughs> they need them to do they, the secretarial work, though. <laughs> who's going to type and who's going to look up things in the computer? Trudy is a whiz at that. They're pretty, pretty good great. at this whole cop stuff. I'm just saying. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Who's going to create all that paperwork that Gerald's going to say it's all garbage? Yeah, <laughs> it's all garbage. She's like, but I worked on that all night. <laughs> <laughs> Castillo says, okay, I'll see what I can do. They've been working on this case for months. They finally got on the inside. They're about, like, basically ready to bring this whole thing down. And now we got this problem. At Palmo, so they're having dinner. It's the duo plus Palmo and Cyrus, the bodyguard. Bubba. <laughs> That's what I like to call him. <laughs> he's taking a few bullets. He's a little slow now. Yeah, he's really slow. He's from Georgia. <laughs> they get out of business right away. Palmo is in bed with everyone, as in literally all the other races that exist in the world. I don't know. That was kind of at lacking one point. I thought he races. was just naming the members of NATO. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think he's lacking in some races. It, was, it certainly was, it, um, how do you say, intensified in the, in the Latin areas. <laughs> A lot of Latin Americans going on there. So he hasn't got everyone on board yet. I was just glad that he included the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> I know, they get so left out of this show. They do, really. Enough with the food. Can we buy drugs yet? <laughs> <laughs> he's also concerned about these cocaine killings because now they're going to start investigating like where the cocaine is coming from so he hasn't decided on what to do with Burnett and Cooper yet and Burnett's like well you waste our time then see you later we're we'll out of here back to our room yeah <laughs> I'm just wondering with this drug dealer even he wants him to take the case like before we can go, we can do a deal I need you guys to solve homicide's case for him <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of odd. Like, hey, you guys aren't cops, but can you solve this crime before we do business? And apparently uh, Tubbs does not like Bubba at all. No, <laughs> no. Tubbs and Bubba are not friendly. And it might have something to do with the Georgia thing. I, I think don't know. that's what it was. I think Tubbs like took offense to that right away. Like, oh, he's from Georgia. He must be a racist. So. <laughs> I think that's what it is. <laughs> he's seen in the heat of the night. He knows. <laughs> he knows what's going on. <laughs> Quick scene at the killer's house where you see that he's got dolls everywhere, plus candles. He's a pervert and he's a weirdo. talking to his <laughs> dolls again in that high-pitched voice. That might be something that I won't ever forget with Miami Vice is that voice that he does talking as the dolls. <laughs> yeah. And then later when he's using that voice, he's holding that clown doll. Ooh. Yeah, the clown doll. <laughs> I had a hard time taking that voice uh, uh, seriously because I kept waiting for him to say, hey, Joffy. <laughs> <laughs> The doll says to, I'm going to refer to the doll as his own person. Yeah. Like in this, the doll says, don't worry, you'll find another ballerina. So he's on the hunt. Another ballerina as pretty as me. Mm -hmm. At the precinct, JL brings back the paperwork the ladies had made up and says, please throw this in your own garbage can, not in mine. (laughs) Do not dirty my garbage cans with with your paper. (laughs) That's it. That's all the sickos we have. That's all the pushers, junkies, and perverts we know. (laughs) But Gerald says it's not the junkies or the perverts, it's the coke. That's the angle, is the coke. Castillo says that the duo might have found themselves accidentally in the middle of this then because they're working with someone who deals in 100% pure cocaine. The bodies they're finding are apparently covered in 100% pure cocaine. I don't know why they keep saying covered. He's injecting them, right? Why do they keep saying like he dipped them in it or something? (laughs) I kept thinking like, is he dipping them in it? Fantastic. (laughs) <laughs> now Vice can take Ace over and this guy can go home, right? He just gives him a light spritz. Well, so it's like oh, a spray okay. bottle. Gotcha. You know? <laughs> it gets hot in Miami in the summertime. Like, humidity. Yeah, yeah, you want to cool down a little mm-hmm. bit. Uh, at a carnival, it's carnival montage time. We haven't had one of those before. We've had lots of montages, including fanboat montage. 
that was the best. Let's have a carnival uh, montage. I, I will say, Billy Idol playing in an arcade just made me wonder if we were in the it, we were in the nineties yet. <laughs> <laughs> the Keller is in his best hat and glasses, walking around with a gigantic insane grin on his face he should be holding a neon sign over his head that says pedophile yeah and he talks to himself while he's walking along in that voice too that's why i couldn't figure such out a happy-go-lucky serial killer i mean <laughs> look at him out on the on the boardwalk having fun he's the only one in a suit in that entire place like that should someone should tackle him before he has the chance to make it to the closest bridge. Also, was it just me or did he look like he was wearing an old timey suit? Like he was wearing old fashioned clothes too. Like because he wore that hat and the glasses and stuff. He looked really old fashioned. There's only two things that a man dressed in a suit at a place like a carnival or a pier or something like that. There's only two things that man does. One, he does weird things to people. <laughs> or two, he's got the best fucking drugs in <laughs> yeah, the entire city. Apparently. <laughs> and turn, come to find out, spoiler, this guy's got both. <laughs> He's a pervert who has a lot of drugs. <laughs> I don't know, but Peter Lundquist of Action 7 News disapproves of rape and murder. It's the sickest he's ever seen, he says. When the montage ends, by the way, Gerald and Castillo show up on the scene. This is the killing. And it's a girl dressed up as a ballerina with, with, with a ballerina doll. Then we're at Palmo. So the duo are playing pool with Palmo. And that's when Action 7 is like, this man is sick and depraved. And he gives away, I mean, I've seen Criminal Minds. I know how this works. You're not supposed to give away all the details of the death, that she was wearing this and that, like what she was dressed up like, all the things that were done to her. I think that's supposed to be a save so when you arrest him, you can be like, how did you know those details? <laughs> <laughs> so I might want to investigate Action yeah. 7 News. <laughs> yeah, wait a minute. No. <laughs> Palmo picks up a pool ball and throws it to the TV. He doesn't like the news either. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was out the news. I think he was losing, and that was, he was using that as an excuse to ruin the game. <laughs> He's just a poor loser. What is it like with him and keeping them there and making them play all kinds of different games? It's weird, right? Because <laughs> like, the next thing you see when they're like, no one will play in the with backyard. him. <laughs> yeah, I know. He's like some kid who didn't have any friends, so now he like forces people to stay there and lose to him. I had a hard time to seriously just because he was wearing that blue knit sweater most of the time. It's like he, you can't be a bad guy in a baby blue knit sweater. <laughs> <laughs> I just imagine how nice that we don't see. One, where he's trying to explain to them his weird card games, where he's like, no, no, when you have a three, you take two from the pile, and you put one. Okay, guys, listen, I don't know how many times I have to go through the rules <laughs> on this. Or two, the night where they didn't Put down the pink toothbrush. <laughs> <laughs> or two, the night where they didn't talk to each other for a second because they played Uno. Yeah. <laughs> no one can Uno and survive it. At the park, the killer, I'm just going to call him Delgado. I mean, I, I don't know well, why. Yeah, I'm gonna... you might as well. At the park, Delgado is talking mm -hmm. to another girl. He gets pulled away by her mom. Thank so, God. Yeah, she gets <laughs> saved. And then the killer starts mm -hmm. talking to the doll again. And the doll is saying, why didn't you just grab her? The doll's a little out there on the edge. Like, well, <laughs> it's the there. doll that's out there. <laughs> <laughs> this, is all, this is all this damn doll's fault. <laughs> the bad mm -hmm. influence on him. Later, the district attorney is giving a press conference saying the city's doing everything that they can. And also kind of declaring martial law. Like, please, people go scour the streets and arrest any one acting weird you're yeah. damn right mayor mccheese <laughs> mayor mccheese authorized martial law and he's also making dolls illegal <laughs> yeah the reporters asked like are you saying that that all bets are off basically when the police can he's like yep no more we don't care about miranda rights and other and warrants at this point we got to get this caught the thank god because now that it's my advice <laughs> yeah, no. so, my advice is like, so we can continue doing what we've been doing great <laughs> <laughs> at Palmos, the duo and Cyrus are hitting golf balls this time, and it's like personal charge. Range. Actually, I think they're just hitting them into the water. Huh? They're hitting them into the water, I think. Yeah. Jerks. <laughs> yeah. How many dolphins are going to get <laughs> balls on them? Don't worry. He's a whale biologist. <laughs> no, you're going with that, right? <laughs> Chubbs and Cyrus start talking, and, the and Cyrus says... Almost horses were arrested last <laughs> night. <laughs> and Tubbs makes a few <laughs> jokes at the horses' expenses about you know the heat really being on because he, even your horses are getting arrested. And Cyrus says, "Hey, me and you mm -hmm. are going to fight one of these times. Everybody don't like you." And Tubbs like, "Let's dance." Well, Tubbs says it's it's sad when the smartest thing you own gets arrested. <laughs>
<laughs> well, basically because Cyrus is a big dung <laughs> ox or something. <laughs> He's like, I don't like you. He's like, what? whatever, I'm ready. Bring it on. <laughs> so Tubbs is like picking a fight with this guy. At Gerald's office, the police are literally bringing in everyone who ever committed a crime against a child or has sold drugs. So they're just bringing everyone in. This is my favorite interrogation. One, his method is basically, hey, do you know where I can get some coke? And the other guy's defense is he wouldn't waste his coke on a kid. Not a kid that he was going to kill. No, yeah, he'd still kill her. He just wouldn't put his coke there. <laughs> he doesn't know where his priorities are at. Gerald and Castillo and Switek step aside. They're talking. They know now, like, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have brought anyone in without having, like, probable cause and everything. So we're going to have a lot of lawsuits out of this for bringing in everyone with no witnesses or any reason to actually bring them in and gerald says worth it like we got to do everything that we can we got to bring this person in the mayor really wants this person to be brought in but we are going to have to bring in palmo because we've literally brought in every other drug dealer but him and all of his street dealers it would look really strange if you it, didn't bring him in at this point while tubs and crockett are living at his place <laughs> like we have to bring him in they're squatting <laughs> Just squatting in his place. <laughs> Quick scene at the beach where Delgado is sitting in his car out in front of a playground. With a doll in his lap. And then a police car drives by and he tosses the doll down and it covers its mouth and then talks like the doll, <laughs> okay, but so with the weird. doll's mouth covered. That was so weird because he talked like his mouth was covered too. He was like mumbling. <laughs> this goes so creepy. <laughs> While in front of a park. Yeah, and no one sees him in the... Like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> I don't like you anymore, Miami Vice. Yeah, you think there would have been a hot dog vendor who would have seen him? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen a good one. hot dog vendor in a while. What's going on in Miami? <laughs> I'm just saying, Miami Vice, you're creeping me out, okay? Like, when you have the ones where people are crazy, like the meat fondler or out where the buses don't run, it's fine because they're just crazy. They're just normal people, but they're off their rocker. You're talking about kids here. You're getting me upset. Making me uncomfortable, Miami. <laughs> <laughs> At Palmo's, he's on the phone with Fuentes, one of his street dealers. And he's telling Fuentes that, hey, they're looking for anyone to be a fall guy because this is being lumped in with cocaine. So just, you know, be on your best behavior, essentially. Castillo comes walking in and Palmo imme immediately recognizes him. Like, oh, I remember you, Castillo. Wasn't it like three or four years ago? No, it was like, like a year ago. Yeah. Which makes me think, like, how does he not know Crockett Tubbs? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? How did he know Castillo? Why does he know them? Maybe it was a Melendez deal. Oh, maybe. Uh, yeah. oh, I remember you and your hot turtleneck. <laughs> he used to deal in ninjas back in yeah. the day. I've seen you in your Speedo. <laughs> <laughs> they step aside and Castillo threatens to impound his yacht. Palmo says, why are you picking on me? I'm just a businessman. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't have... Yeah. Like, it's not my problem that these girls are getting desperate for drugs and then getting themselves killed. That's not my deal. I'm just a businessman. Castillo says that the coke the girls are covered in is pure, 100% pure cocaine. And only a few dealers actually have that. That's why we're talking to you. And also, the girls are not drug addicts. This is, they've never used drugs before. Also, we know a lot of information about you. And you have a couple of new people you've never <laughs> yeah. dealt with before living in your house. You might want to look around for any bowls. And also, <laughs> why didn't Castillo like, pretend to question them? Like, who are they? Maybe they're part of something. But he just avoids them altogether. And then, of course, when he walks in, Crockett and Tubbs look super suspicious. They're like, oh, crap. <laughs> Dad's here. <laughs> Act like we're doing something. Clearly, important. they're just there to clean the carpets. Yeah, exactly. Like, put down your drink. Or sell Stop. him insurance. <laughs> Stop. Stop looking suspicious like we did something. <laughs> God, I really hope he buys these Kirby vacuums. <laughs> Fast scene at the beach. And I'm sorry, this is the scene where he's out in front of the playground. And he, the killer is telling the doll that they're going to cruise around and find one. Like, no more playing around. We're oh, because go there's, no, there's nobody at this playground now. People are finally... Finally, getting their crap together and making so the kids come home. <laughs> hey, how about you teenage girls? Don't go anywhere for the next couple of weeks till they catch this killer. Nah, let them go everywhere. <laughs> then he gets a call on the car phone. He's very upset. So now we go back to Palmos. The duo are talking to each other. Their contact still hasn't shown up. They're concerned that the killer investigation is going to mess up theirs because he's so on lockdown because they're picking up all the street dealers and there's all these things happening that he's not selling any drugs right now. So who knows if he's going to bring in any of the street people that they'll never meet their contacts. So this deal that's happening with the cocaine killings is causing a problem in their case now. Palmo shows up and Crockett says, look, man, we got to leave. We've been here too long already. You're costing me a lot of money. I got to go. 
And you're all, and you're basically out of business because you can't do anything. So you're useless to us. Palmo says, no, I'm sorry, you're saying. Pretty much like, yeah, you this ain't going to. This is Hotel anywhere. California. <laughs> you can check out, but you can't ever leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this comes up to my favorite scene of the episode. He is going to prove to Crockett and Tubbs that he is being proactive about the creepy doll killer. And so he brings them into a meeting and he starts the meeting by telling everyone that that we're not good because we're not businessmen like these cops. <laughs> we need to be more business like. And then we get this. We've been talking. We talked about comic books in the open. And I just instantly flashed like a Lex Luthor Legion of Doom <laughs> where you have every of the all of the heads of the major crime families in Miami all sitting around and they're like taking a vote, you know, it, except I guess it wouldn't be the Legion of Doom. It'd be something more like the Legion of, uh, of Dumb or Dumber. <laughs> I, I hope they have it like a special handshake or like a, <laughs> a, a special ring. Fantastic that all of the bad guys, you know, they get together and they vote on stuff like this. <laughs> They're all in agreement. They will not do anything else except for help the police bring down, not necessarily help the police, but in a way it's help the police. Well, like in their catch, own way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's catch this scumbag, get them off the street. That way they can go back to doing business. The camera pans as they're all agreeing and boom, Delgado, one of the street dealers is also our serial killer. And he also very creepily says, let's get this guy. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. dun. <laughs> If I was in that Legion of Doom meeting, I might have taken notice of the guy sitting with the doll, but I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> Who keeps talking in a doll's voice? Like now we have another montage. We have a we're going to go muscle people on the street montage. <laughs> the as best the, kind. <laughs> as the, the Legion of Dumb go around and strong arm every weirdo that they know out on the street and ask them if they're the ones that are killing teenagers and dressing them up like dolls i was confused as to why they were harassing the hookers like what do they know about this like what <laughs> hookers don't have time for dolls i don't know but we 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 end up back to benny benny the flasher that's what they call that's what cyrus calls him but he's been arrested twice for child like molestation they said yes in the beginning. They're, so cyrus and the duo are driving in the limo they recognize cyrus re re recognizes benny they pull over, they get they chase Benny up into his apartment, they get him at gunpoint, essentially, and he says that he hasn't been doing anything, that he's been going to his therapy sessions, and that they fixed him, and that he's actually allowed to look at porn, too, because the doctor said that that's okay, that way the fantasy just lives in his head, he's not actually acting on it. Cyrus doesn't like any of that, grabs him to go throw him out the window. Crockett stops Cyrus short and says, let's talk to him for just a few minutes. Benny gives in and says, I heard a wino that lives with Captain George, who's like a... Um, it was like a shelter. Like a halfway house. Yeah, like a shelter. He, he runs like, like a shelter. Says they saw something at a park, but never reported it. Which you never know what they saw. Am I just me or did they actually talk about it? They never explain it. Okay. So it's all vague. Gotcha. But then they just leave Benny on the floor and leave him to his, you know... Pedophile dealings. <laughs> well, I mean, I have questions. He was looking at a dirty magazine full of adult women, though. So I guess that crosses over. You can look at all of them. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I think no? what they're getting at is like, that's his crutch. Gotcha. That he looks at re regular porn all the time. Like, that's his thing. So he's very friendly, though. I mean, to the staff when he was checking into his hotel. Yeah. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I got a bag full of porn. How are you doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess if I had a bag full of porn, I might be happy too. <laughs> yeah, bag full of porn and some bologna. It's gonna be a wonderful day. Fascinating <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> at the killers at Delgados, I should say. He's burning all of his dolls. So the paper is talking about the murders. It's a huge fire. Um, how come there was? Place. How come there was no uh, screaming? I, <laughs> there was no screaming when that fire went off. <laughs> <laughs> there should have been. He should have been. Doll <laughs> 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 silence. He should have been, been going off in his doll voice like a hundred times over. Like no, no. <laughs> I was. I didn't even think about that. That's so crazy. Uh, all I was thinking the whole time is like, God, I hope he doesn't live in an apartment building. Like, this would suck. Yeah, because it went up fast, too. He said, Whatever he put on that, yeah. he went up fast. But, I mean, all those thousands of screams would have been heard. <laughs> but he kept the clown one, just for reference. Well, the clown ones yeah, are at yeah. the I keep gym. that one. How was he going to dress? 
<laughs> it's like he got another one. Like he went to his booth oh, yeah, he and went he to his got booth, another yeah. one. But, but how was he going to dress that somebody up like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a matter of if. Poor also. planning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like what? <laughs> At Captain George, the duo and Cyrus show up and they want to know what they heard. George's like, I don't talk to cops, but I'll talk to you guys. You guys seem like you're all right. He says that. Yeah, uh, why Mikhail's not? Navy will count for $5. <laughs> he says that someone who sleep, stays there every once in a while's name's Prophet. He saw something. He's probably hanging out at a park. But then we go to the carnival. So why well, so, didn't make any sense at all to me? There must have been something with Prophet that we just don't see. Oh, so they, like, and he must have told him to go to yeah. Benny. What's like, not Benny to go talk to Delgado or to to Rickman. Yeah, there you go, Rickman. Yeah, yeah. At the carnival, Delgado was talking to his new doll, that clown figurine. That is so creepy. <laughs> he says he's and not that having doll's any. kind of a dick, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Delgado says he's not having any fun anymore. The doll says is that's supposed to be fun. Now look over there. So Cooper and and Burnett the, and Cyrus go up to the carney, and when they uh, go to talk to the carney, he's like, "Oh, you know, Delgado, you know, the guy that likes the dolls." <laughs> he puts up a little bit of a fight in the beginning they ask him like hey how do you win this game has anyone won any dolls recently it's like you can't actually win this game because one is one is a bullet and the other two are blank so you'll never actually win and also they use it as a cover because they put the drugs inside of the dolls because cyrus shoots one of the dolls and you see that there's drugs inside of it so they use the dolls as cover for moving the drugs back and forth so th they don't give any of them out anyway and he says that the only person who's been by recently that's ever taken one has been Delgado. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is all while Sonny has Rickman at BB gunpoint. <laughs> what was going to happen? He's like one inch away from your <laughs> eye. <laughs> that's that's got, only got one BB gun, and two, <laughs> one BB and two blanks. <laughs> <laughs> Cyrus then finds Delgado at the carnival, walks up to him and says, this is bad for business. And then asks him, which one of these turns you on? Delgado flips around, shoots his gun at Cyrus and takes off running, runs up on top of a roof as people scatter around the carnival he then falls off the roof while cyrus and his other crony are firing at him he falls into a pile of inner tubes being used for who knows what <laughs> reason <laughs> Let, let's just recap all that one he is pretty nimble for a little guy <laughs> um, for a pervert that's what you mean <laughs> well, he, he, he got up on that roof like it was nothing <laughs> and, and then he jumps in the floaties in the pile of floaties and they just start firing at the floaties. Notice <laughs> how not one floaty pops. <laughs> I missed that with the main issue. That. Yeah, no, actually, our son said that. Our our 11 year old was like, <laughs> How come none of those pops? What are they, they like? They are terrible shots. Or they are now shooting with the blanks of the BB gun. <laughs> They peel back the inner tubes and they find Delgado talking as the doll saying, please don't hurt him. Please leave us alone. That was a clown voice, though. <laughs> <laughs> At Palmo's, the duo come in and Tubbs is saying their cover's going to be blown because they can't just let Delgado be murdered. They can't let Palmo kill him. So they're going to have to try and talk him out of it. They got to try and keep their cover while also talking him out of just murdering someone. And I was struck by this scene because this is the exact same set, the exact, the exact same house of when Crockett slapped the hell out of that porno snuff film director in an episode earlier. Th I think it's this season. Yeah, beat the crap out of him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just surprised that they want to arrest him. It's so much less paperwork if they just let him get get killed. <laughs> Also, he's a pervert, so yeah, that's okay. He can just go. <laughs> no one's going to miss him. He burned all his dolls. He has no one to go home to. <laughs> he's okay. <laughs> no one's going to miss you. <laughs> Palmo says no. He's going to be charged and have a jury of his peers, meaning everyone that works in the gang, because I can't just kill him. Because there'd be and too much co conflict with the other people. Exactly. The, the other people don't know why he would be being killed. So it might cause a war within his own organization. So he has to lay out why Delgado needs to be killed. And it's for obvious reasons. Like, it shouldn't take any uh, real convincing on this group of people. Like, he's murdering little kids. Well, you'd hope, anyway. <laughs> I, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. I've seen The Wire. They don't have trials. That's not how these things get worked out. Well, I buy it, like, 
with it being that it, it could cause a war because no one would know exactly what it was. And maybe he was just being a scapegoat because he mentions earlier in the episode, Fuentes, that the police are just looking for a scapegoat. And so if Palmo just picks, if they don't know anything about it, it's like, well, they must have just picked Delgado to be the scapegoat. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I don't think Burnett feels very confident. I'm not sure if this is the type of law he's used to practicing. He, I think he's more <laughs> real estate law. <laughs> because he brings up to Palmo. Palmo says, oh, yeah, that's right. You're a lawyer. He says, Crockett says, like, hey, why don't you just give him to the police? You'll be a big hero and everyone will know and it'll be better. And he's like, oh, wait a minute. You're a lawyer, aren't you? And like Crockett's like, ah, crap. <laughs> Why did I say anything? <laughs> I want the Leech of Doom trial. <laughs> <laughs> so now Sonny has to go in and go talk to Delgado. Which is a bag of cats, basically. <laughs> they go in, goes into the bathroom and Delgado <laughs> says, wait, I remember you. You were at the meeting. You're Burnett with Cooper. You guys are supposed to be helping Palmo deal with this business. By the way, it rains in Miami or whatever it is, what, whatever the code word is. And it's like, oh, my God, he's not only the serial killer and also works for Palmo and is a street dealer, but is also the informant for Miami Vice. And he's like, and I know you're a cop and you're going to get me off of this or I'm going to tell them and we're so both dead. Such a small world. It turns out co-workers this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Legion of Dumb, Delgado and Crockett come walking out into a room circled by the dealers. And this is like a stage. I don't know where they are. They're not at Palmo's It's, a, it's like a theater. That's what that is. I think that's what that is originally. Where where they it makes Wouldn't it make sense at the theater? Because that's where that guy was doing the porn movies, too. It has to be a theater because later when Tubbs gets in a fight, he ends up like rolling around in like all the lights and getting in the way of all the grips. Yeah, but it's definitely uh, not at Palmo's house. No, no. It's a theater that they go to. That's yeah. It's like separate. They pull up. It's not. It's they not have Palmo's a drama house. club on Tuesdays. <laughs> it's a it's a nightclub. Later on, Castillo says they're at club whatever, 1354. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Some number. The, the whole Legion's a part of it. They're doing a showing of Guys and Dolls next Wednesday. Exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's a club and it just has a stage. So Palmo starts off I with thought being... we'd just kill him and call it an episode. <laughs> no, no. We're going to talk about sticking this landing. Palmo starts his prosecution of Delgado, explaining to all the dealers, like, this man is killing children and is also associated with us like he's got to go but mostly he's making us look bad it's like not so much that he cares about these kids he's more so like we can't sell our coke because of these damn <laughs> dead girls <laughs> they're both not too good at this whole lawyer thing <laughs> at the precinct Gerald is questioning rickman so the police have done their job too they finally figured out that delgado is the person that they're looking for they head over to Palmo's. No one's there. And none of the street dealers are to be found either. So they don't know what the hell's going on. They don't know where anyone is. They just know now it's it might be too late to bring anyone down in this, not including the two un undercover police officers that they don't know where they are. No one's home, which means we can all go home. <laughs> so back at the theater, Sonny starts his defense. And his defense is clearly, I'm stalling. I mean, he's saying like that. Delgado is crazy, he's and that's sick, why he yeah, can't, help he can't himself. stop himself. But it's really like he's really drawing it out to really stall for time while Tubbs is trying to call Castillo. Yeah, Tubbs does get through and give Castillo the address for where they are or the name of the club. I think it's one, two, three, five club. There you go, something <laughs> like that. Yeah, Alkit does know a lot about the mind of a crazy guy. He was once the meat fondler, so. <laughs> If anyone can make this defense that he didn't know it was bad, so it's okay. Like, if anyone can make that work, it's the the meat fondler. <laughs> then Tubbs gets grabbed from behind by Cyrus. And Tubbs like, let's go chump. And they go fight in the AV yeah, room. Let's wrestle. <laughs> and Tubbs eventually pushes Cyrus into like, a control board. He gets electrocuted. Trial, Sonny is still stalling. He's supposed to be his world class lawyer, but I don't know how don't much hit, everyone. You must have quit. <laughs> <laughs> and then Delgado eventually snaps and just starts talking as the doll to himself and then to everyone else. And then he starts having the conversation with the doll and himself. He's gone. <laughs> and then apparently no one was actually going to stop him from running. So he just ran. He could have just run out the door at any time, apparently. And uh, the doll yes. asked him, like, how come you didn't run out the door? Why'd you run up the ladder? <laughs> it's like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> 
He goes up the ladder on top of the lights. He keeps talking as the doll. Everyone puddles. Puddles. <laughs> Everyone huddles. <laughs> oh, they puddled. <laughs> Everyone huddles. Great, now he's stuck up on the lights. <laughs> Everyone huddles right underneath him. Delgado finally snaps, jumps off the lights. Everyone's able to get out of the way except for Palmo. Goes dark. We come back. Castiel and Gerald are there as the police come in. They see that Delgado Poor and Palmo adjourned. are dead. <laughs> Fuentes says that justice has been served and then Crockett says well because uh, the what's his name the, the homicide detective goes which one is the one and then Crockett says take your pick <laughs> and that's the end of the episode Delgado uh, I mean let's talk about this for a minute he did a Peter Pan to the ultimate suplex of death <laughs> um, which is once again a lot more athletic than I made, than I originally thought he was. He's a little weird, but man, he's athletic. Yeah, but also, I, mean, I was there goes young. what like three months of undercover work. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying that Shane McMahon to be able to go off those lights and be able to deliver an elbow of pain. Yeah, he'd land it and, and he'd survive it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he's, he is unbreakable. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you could say he stuck the landing, but this episode <laughs> didn't. <laughs> And it continues our trend of we don't know how to end this question mark. If we had 15 more minutes, we might be able to pull off an ending here, but we just weren't able to put it together in the last few minutes. They didn't need 15 more minutes. Just shoot them. Call it an episode. <laughs> like we, we we saw all the good stuff. You caught them. Let the Legion of Doom take it out. And this will be, you know, we'll chalk this up for another one where Vice doesn't win, but the bad guys don't really win either. So yeah, that's now true. we're out three months of buddying up against some yuppie. Then now the deal's never going to happen. Yeah, I got more thoughts. I'm going to save it for, for my final thoughts. I got more about this Daisy Indy. <laughs> I got more about it. <laughs> but all in all, it's a good episode. If you ignore the last 30 seconds, it's a great episode. It's just, and I'm nitpicking here about how the episode ends. And I'll save it, but there's this, I could be convinced the, the, the other way. Let's first go talk about our music in this episode. We have a classic rock band that we've never talked about before. So let's go break down this week's music. All right, John, we got someone I've never heard of before. One band that you've talked about before. And then there's Aerosmith. Yeah, so let's get Sweet 16 by Billy Idol out of the way. This is his third appearance. He was also talked about in Down for the Count, Part 2, and The Rising Sun of Death. We have already mentioned on how he was almost T-1000 in Terminator. We've talked quite a bit about him. The song Sweet 16 was on the album Whiplash Smile in 1987. It was a hit. In fact, it got all the way down to number 12. On the Hot 100 on June 27th, 1987. So, Idol would actually only have two more top 40 singles in his career after this song, since he's no longer relevant. Goodbye, Billy Idol. <laughs> okay, next, let's talk about the song Capriccio Arabe Ar 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 by Francisco. Torrego, uh, Sean, Francisco. <laughs> I look forward to every week where we have someone that's got a really complicated name because I love your <laughs> attempts at saying it. I don't know how to say it either, and I would be just as bad. Yes. But I love that you're back to a corner and you have to. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> By Francisco Torrega. So he is a Spanish composer and classical guitarist. During the Romantic period, and to give you an idea, that's the late 1800s, early 1900s. As he passed, he died in 1909 at the age of 57. Damn! Why, how does his music end up in Miami Vice? Well, he is known for such classic pieces as Recuerdos de la Alhambra. And I mean, everyone knows... <laughs> Roquedos de la Alhambra. <laughs> okay, so reading his biography, I could tell you a lot of old-timey facts, but <laughs> what really caught my attention, Francisco's father was a musician. He used to play with his dad's guitar growing up, but he ran away when he was a little kid, and he fell into an irrigation ditch and injured his eyes. And so his parents, obviously, I mean, if your kid fell into an 
uh, irrigation ditch in each other's eyes. Wouldn't you put him in the music classes? Isn't that the <laughs> obvious answer? <laughs> well, stop painting. <laughs> So his parents put him into music classes because if he was going to go blind, that they had seen other blind musicians succeed before. And this is, he's still pretty young because the second time he ran away, he was 10 years old. He was being tutored by Julian Arcus, who was a concert guitarist, and he would run away and try to make his own music career by playing uh, in coffee shops. His dad would find him, bring him home. And then about three years later, he would run away again. This time, he would go to Valencia and join a gang of gypsies. <laughs> Once again, he was found and returned home, only to run away and join... I, I cannot confirm if it was the same gang of gypsies or a different <laughs> gang of gypsies. How many gangs of gypsies are there? <laughs> I don't know. But but let's just say by the time he was... In the, he was a little shit. <laughs> basically <laughs> i don't know why they kept going after him the fourth time he would have been on his own <laughs> so he eventually returned home and then became very 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 famous traveled all across europe and then died 13 days after half his face went numb um if that's some kind of a coincidence so our last song is ragdoll Aerosmith. And everyone's heard of Aerosmith, right? <laughs> Often known as the boys from Boston. Are they really known as the bad boys from Boston? Are they? Are they from Boston? Might explain some things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bad boys, though? Like, what? Bad boys. Come on. Yeah. Made up of uh, Steven Tyler, Joe Perry, Tom Hamilton, Joey Kramer, and at one time, Ray Tabano. They were formed in 1970 and originally called the Jam Band. There were a few other names in there. So, but <laughs> in, in, in 1971, though, Tabano would be replaced by Brad Whitford and they would never look back. Sorry, Tabano. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, so in their in the beginning, uh, when they were called the Jam Band, they've said in interviews and biographies that they pretty much. Uh, when they were practice, they would just get stoned and watch episodes of Three Stooges. <laughs> I like these guys. They were pretty much instant su successes, though. I mean, they formed in 70. They fired a guy. By 71, they had the band formed and got a little bit of local acclaim about them. And by 1972, they were signed by Columbia Records, and which followed a string of gold and platinum records. Albums like Get Your Wings, 1974. Or Toys in the Attic, 1975. Or Rocks in 1976. I mean, old album every year. Like, that's just crazy. Damn. By the end of the 70s, they were touring. They had a dozen Hot 100 singles, which is one of the most popular bands of the decade. But like most things, ring and partying and eventual drug addiction took its toll. Tyler even actually once claimed that he spent up to $64 million on drugs during his, <laughs> his drug addiction, which Perry quickly stated as being completely false and, and, and utter bullshit. <laughs> and shut up. Not that there's any animosity between uh, Joe Perry and Steven Tyler. <laughs> I don't know. Let's go to this so, video clip of Steven Tyler falling off the stage and see what Joe Perry has to say yes. about that. <laughs> what I love about the, uh, the biography I read was that things would get so bad that Joe Perry and Brad Whitford would leave the band in 1979 and then in 80. And they would leave the band until 1984. And the story in which why they left the band was Joe Perry's wife threw a glass of milk on someone else's wife. And according to Steven Tyler, he fired Joe Perry. <laughs> They would replace Perry and Whitfield, and they actually, the band struggled until 1984 when they struck a new deal with Geffen, which helped bring Perry and Whitford back to the band. 1986, they were still trying to make a comeback and still trying to get back to the popularity they once knew when they would do a mashup with Run DMC had just sampled their song, Walk This Way. That mashup, it, not only being one of the most famous rock and rap mergers in music history pretty much was their comeback i mean it pretty much saved their career and brought them back to the level of popularity they were before and what followed was the magic of aerosmith in the late 80s and early 90s with albums like pump the grip and nine lives we would meet a young live tyler 
and her friend, Alicia Silverstone, whose career would be spurred in music videos that I grew up watching. <laughs> yeah, I remember her jumping off that bridge, but actually having a rope tied around her waist. So all in all, by the time they get uh, they got to the 2000s, they released three more albums in 2001, 2004, and 2012. They started. They appeared in TV shows, all kinds of different stuff. Hell, I want to even. I, I want to say there's even a Scooby Doo meets Aerosmith something <laughs> somewhere. The Simpsons, Flaming Moe's. Yeah, yeah. Aside from TV and movie appearances, they've played the Super Bowl. And after 48 years of performing, they have sold over 150 million records. They have 25 gold albums, 18 platinum albums, 12 multi-platinum albums. His daughter, Liv Tyler, is a successful actress in her own right. Their soundtrack is the only good thing about Armageddon the movie. So, <laughs> um... So, Sorry, Buck Buck. <laughs> you and Ben Affleck just didn't do it. <laughs> Insanely successful. And I will tell you, I could have gotten a lot more in depth about Aerosmith. They're, they're one of those bands where it's like memoirs are, are like 500 pages. And like every chapter is a, a different story about something crazy that happened yeah. on tour, you know. And, and from 1970 until about 84, because I want to say that the reason Perry and Whitfield joined again was because they, they agreed to get clean. Those stories are obviously the best stories. And then from 84 on, you get a whole lot of sober stories so you get stories about you know the guys with their families paint you know and <laughs> steven tyler letting his daughter paint his nails you know the atmosphere changes most recently steven tyler is doing one of those america's got talent or american idol shows i mean i'm always so mixed on aerosmith i am let me preface this with saying i am not an aerosmith fan at all like i don't really enjoy their music but i respect their place in rock history and their, how how successful they've been in their era of rock and how many different decades their career span and how in pop culture centered that they've been even as they were banned in the 70s but you can keep your aerosmith <laughs> 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 but... <laughs> let's go give our final thoughts on this episode i'm really interested to see where everyone else lands i've kind of hinted at by standing <laughs> Not up so and subtly. yelling okay. my opinion about this episode. Let's go give our final thoughts on this one. All right, I'm going to start off. And you know I'm fired up when I say I'm the first one that's going to open up on the final thoughts of the episode. Look, I understand totally in the history of the pantheon of cop shows where this episode comes in. And I will say... I like this episode. I really, really like this episode. And it is creepy. And it made me uncomfortable. And I, I liked it. I liked the bad guy. I loved the drug tie-in, too, that he is also a drug dealer. And that the drug dealers feel like, in order what's best for their business is for this person to go away. So it makes it really complicated for the vice team to figure out what the hell it is that they're supposed to do. How do they crack this case? How do they get the serial killer and these drug dealers off the street when they're all in cahoots with each other? Unknown cahoots. They don't know that they're all associated with the same people. I thought that was all great. Everything was great about this episode. But it's just like we had where at, by the time we get to the end, it's like, oh, this is a boat scene filmed in our previous season because Parker's <laughs> got short hair. And that's not the same guy driving that boat. And we're yeah. just going to have him jump we in don't the care. boat. <laughs> We just ran out of time. We got to end this thing. We're going to have him commit suicide on top of Palmo. And that's going to end both of the stories at the exact same time. Just feels so lazy. I love that they were having this court case, too, at the very end. And I was hoping that the police were going to come in. There was going to be a shootout. Palmo was going to get killed right away. They would have to chase Delgado. Then he'd have his last moment of him, like, in his doll voice, asking for them to to leave him alone or maybe have palmo kill him at the end and then the police arrest palmo and then you have to decide is palmo really that much of a bad guy because he did all this work to bring down this killer that was harming children but we ended up with this lazy ending i love this episode i really really love this episode and i really creeps me out and that's why i love this so much but vice season four vice you gotta work on these endings, man. <laughs> <laughs> All hands on deck meeting. We gotta discuss this thing. John, what are your final thoughts? 
I mean, I think you pretty much said everything that I was thinking as far as the episode. I liked the episode. I maybe not have loved it as much as you, but I really liked it. I thought it was a good, like you said, it's the the kind of serial killer story that gets regurgitated in all these different cop shows. It always has, because dolls are just creepy as hell to begin <laughs> with. It was fantastic all the way up and, and then all the way up until... He runs away, climbs up on the lights, and jumps like he's Peter Pan. You know, <laughs> I was waiting for, like you, for the the trial ends in street justice, or you know, or or something, uh, or the you know Castillo shows up in the shootout or something, you know. But it's just they just keep blowing the endings this season all the way up until that point. It was a great episode. I did make a little bit out of homicide trying to pass off the case only because I feel like getting into season four, we have dealt more with murder than good old drugs and hookers where vice was supposed to be. So I'm getting a little tired of, of homicide passing the workload off on us. Uh, <laughs> do your own work guys. <laughs> At the end of this episode, it, it got it, what was it? It was like two, three months. Crockett and in tubs have been working to get in with this guy, and it's all gone. Aside from that, it, it is a fantastic episode and incredibly creepy. Music wasn't too bad. <laughs> Melissa, you're our vice expert. We're leaning on you here. What are your final thoughts on this episode? I like this episode. It creeps the hell out of me. It always, it always creeped me out really bad. It's definitely one of the, like, there's not many episodes of Miami Vice where I feel really creeped out by the people because usually they're just like drug dealers or, you know, maybe there'll be a murderer here and there, but they're still doing it because they're for business reasons. This is someone who does it for fun. And I understand that he's like, obviously he's crazy, which makes it even creepier because he, I think he really thinks he's talking to these dolls. And the fact that he drives around with the dolls and he's got it like in his, like basically he's like a flasher, but instead of flashing people, he's got a doll in his jacket. It's so <laughs> creepy. And I don't like dolls anyway, so that makes it, <laughs> <laughs> makes it even better. I was kind of disappointed because I feel like that they sh they say that Crockett and Tubbs did all this work on this, but they don't really do any real police work in it until the end. And even then, they're not the ones that figure out, like, they have help to figure out who is actually the killer. So that's yeah, disappointing. Should, they should get Cyrus Edge. He was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I'm disappointed there was no actual police work like done by them. They were just kind of, I mean, it was fun. It was good to see them hang out, <laughs> share a toothbrush. <laughs> also, can we talk about how they had to share a bedroom at that guy's house? <laughs> Who was sleeping where? <laughs> Once again, why are they doing this? We don't know. It should be homicide that does it, but we just gloss over that. <laughs> I knew that mm -hmm. they were going to make, I mean, obviously I've seen the episode before, but when you watch it for the first time, you're like, okay, so this is going to be about like, vengeance because these people don't really care about these kids these drug dealers and stuff they just care about the bottom line that they're getting they're the ones that are getting like accused of it and they're losing money so i knew where it was going i hate the ending because they talk about when they go in the building they're like well, how are we going to get them both we can't get them both it's like well this is the perfect way to get them both they're both dead that's not mm -hmm. how it, it should have been they should have arrested one of them or whatever at least see the ending it was too easy or maybe maybe they should just let the creepy guy jumped to his death and they had to arrest Palmo or something. I don't yeah, know. Arrest somebody. Somebody, Please, do somebody something. get arrested. But yeah. so what is that where does that leave the duo? You Are literally still... have all of the major players in Miami in one room. Arrest someone. So that's my question. Like John just said, they have all the major players in Miami in that room. Where does that leave the duo as far as their their undercover? Are they still pretending to be cops when they watch him jump or what? After Does that mean Crockett now pretend to be a lawyer for the rest of the time? <laughs> yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So are they still are they still pretending to be cops when the cops come? Maybe it could be to be undercover when the cops come and they ask him like which one was which it was it? Why would he ask Crockett that? He's just supposed to be a criminal. Like, <laughs> I don't know. Why are you asking me? <laughs> so I'm saying. So now is it, I guess yeah, now he has to be a lawyer. Oh, they just never deal with those twenty criminals. There's more criminals to be had. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat you know we had a great week off we're happy to be back and we're getting so so close to the end of season four this was episode 16 we only have five more episodes to go until the end of the season 
So email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your favorite moments and your favorite episodes so far of season four. We're obviously going to take some time off at the end of the season, take a couple of weeks to get refreshed and go into the final season of Miami Vice. So we would love to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Let us know what have been your favorite moments and your favorite episodes of this season so far. Go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to subscribe. You can find all the ways to get a hold of us. You can find all the ways to support us. Support level number one, contact us. Support number two, leave a review of the podcast on your podcast, your platform of choice. Go ahead and give it the highest rating of all. Just whatever it is, four pies, six tomatoes, like whatever the highest rating it is, go ahead and give that to us. But don't leave a review. No one ever reads the reviews. So instead, put in there how Palmo and Castillo know each other. We want your fan <laughs> fiction on how Palmo and Castillo know each other. And if you can, weave in the Speedo. Just weave it in the story somehow. The last way to support us, if you happen to have a nickel, a dime, a dollar available, we would be happy to take your support. If you go over to patreon.com slash go with the heat, show us your support. Show us that you want to invest in the Go With The Heat podcast as we continue on this podcast and after Miami Vice is done. So we'd love to see your support. Whatever it is, a nickel, a dime. If you give us a dollar, I guarantee I will share a nickel with John. I guarantee it. He'll get it. He'll get an entire nickel. And if you want, if you want to make sure John gets that nickel, mail us that nickel. (laughs) (laughs) That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals. 